you are welcome to my channel. I'll be talking about Hiroto Anya. I will go through some terms before getting into the subject proper. Hiroto is a gap or an aperture. Some would define this as an opening or a bridge in continuation of something or event or a structure. In this case, it is an opening in the diaphragm where the cervical passes through to join the stomach in the abdomen. The ania is a protrusion of a part or can sometimes be of the entire organ and mostly gastrointestinal tract involving the intestine through the gap or the weakened wall of the cavity where it belongs, usually due to weakness that is probably age-related or sometimes atrogenic. And I've said atrogenic because it could be secondary to surgery. And many times it could be as a result of congenital anatomical defect. The diaphragm is a very thin muscle separating the abdominal and thoracic cavities. It is very flexible, therefore it can adjust by contracting or relaxing based on the respiratory phases. Now that we have gone through all the terms, what then is hereta ania olibao? This is a situation when the stomach or part of it bodies or protrudes through an opening in the diaphragm, that is the hiatus, into the thoracic cavity, or otherwise known as chest cavity. It depends on the size of the stomach or the part that protrudes into the chest cavity through the diaphragm. The entire content of the stomach can be contained in the sac that has protruded into the chest cavity. As far as hiatal hernia is concerned, we have two types. The first one I'm going to talk about is the sliding hiatal hernia. Here we'll have the lower part of the cervicus and the stomach both sliding into the chest cavity. This is the most common and of less concern compared to the second type. The second type of hiatania is known as paraosophagia. Here, the gastroesophageal junction remains intact. Part of the stomach is squeezed up into the chest cavity by the side of the cervical. That is why the name is given para, paraosophagus, paraosophagia. So by the side of the cervicals. The hernated part will remain in the chest cavity. But remember, the gastroesophageal junction remains intact in the abdominal cavity. This is less common. That is not a good news because it is the most dangerous and it is more concerning. The clinical features. Mostly asymptomatic particularly when small. I mean, when the part that has hernated is very small. But most times, we will accidentally pick this while investigating the patient for something else. But that is not the case with large hiatal hernia because it will be symptomatic. And why that? the acid and food content of the stomach will continue to bed the large portion of the cervicals affected and will be dealing with regurgitation of the gastric content into the mouth. Acid reflux, heartburn, chest pain, and abdominal pain. Other symptoms could include obstructive symptoms like swelling difficulty, that is dysphagia, where the 
content of the food particles ingested can now go down to get to the stomach. There can be shortness of breath as a result of compression or squeezing of the lungs. Remember, I've just mentioned a while ago that this time we are dealing with very large you know, type of herniated parts of the stomach or the paraosophagus. Shortness of breath can also be caused when the gastric content has blocked the airway. Still on clinical features, sometimes a epiglottis could be open. And if that is the case, the contents of gastric uh, secretion, food, and so on, could be aspirated into the lungs. So aspiration into the lungs will be possible. And with that, we'll be dealing with aspiration pneumonitis. And over time, we might be dealing with aspiration pneumonia, and the patient will cough. And even with that, there could be fever and so on. Still on clinical features, when the ania is long standing and the esophagus is being bathed by the content of the abdomen, I mean, the content of the stomach all the time, then we can have abdominal pain, gastric ulceration with probable bleeding, and when the bleeding is serious, it can lead to an acute emergency surgery and hematemesis from bleeding, black stools from bleeding, and a massive, very massive bleeding will lead to hematochesia, hypotension, shock, that is hypovolemic shock, anemia, on account of which the individual will be wheeled to emergency room and from there to surgery department for emergency surgery. There are certain situations when people would think they have gastroesophageal reflux disease only, not knowing that they have aortic ania. But the red flag here that would distinguish aortic ania from gastroesophageal reflux disease is if you think that you have gastroesophageal reflux disease and you have your antacids or proton pump inhibitors or H2 receptor blockers like smetidine and co, and you've taken all those medications but you are not getting any relief in any form, then begin to suspect something more horrible like the outer hand. What are the possible risk factors here? Obesity. That is modifiable, right? Old age, greater than 50, we can't modify that. Smoking and alcohol, we can modify that. Anatomical defect could be fixed surgically. Okay, what are the causes? If we have the risk factors, then how can we then come down with aorta ania, like congenital large aortas, when it is very large, it's likely we are going to come down with it. Aortogenic, that is post-surgery or trauma. Increased intra-abdominal pressure can push the content of gastrointestinal tract to any of the defects around. Coffee for a long time. Sneezing for a long time, weight lifting, constipation, vomiting, and certain forms of access. What are the possible differential diagnoses of theater and could be gastrointestinal reflux disease, could be myocardial infarction, angina factories, was a vaginal motility disorder. And of course, one of the features or complications is pneumonia. So it could be pneumonia on its own without the other end. 
How do we make diagnosis easier? Let's have barium swallowed down with that trick. We can have upper gastrointestinal tract endoscopy and of course osophageal manometry. I have put laboratory here that is not diagnostic. It, and then I have you know, taken the time to write it here that it depends on the prominent symptom or symptoms. But I have not forgotten to let you know that it is not diagnostic. So if the individual is anemic or bleeding, we can have complete blood count down. In the face of severe vomiting, we can have electrolyte assay. And if the individual is coughing for a long period of time, why not ruling out some possible problem like PTB and pulmonary function tests could be done. And of course, when there is fever, in the case of pneumonia, we can have the sputum or blood for microscopy, control, and sensitivity. So the symptoms will determine what other investigations we can do. There's no need wasting the money of the patient on all these investigations if the symptoms are not prominent. How do we make treatment here? Mm -hmm. The treatment is divided into three categories. The first is non-pharmacological interventions. All modifiable risk factors should be modified. Stop smoking. Raise the head of the bed, reduce the weight. These interventions are not new to those who have listened to my presentation on gastroesophageal reflux disease treatment. Make sure there is three hours at least or greater between your last meal before you lay on bed. Lay on bed doesn't necessarily mean at night. You might be working a shift you now duties, then you need to rest in the afternoon, then go to work at night. So I'm not gonna be dogmatic to say, okay, before you go to bed at night. No, before you lay down, before you rest flat on the couch, make sure it is more than three hours after your last meal. No alcohol. Please don't be upset at me, just advising you. No chocolate, no citrus foods, no garlic or onions, no spicy foods or tomatoes, reduce your caffeine, and no light means at once. Somebody is mad. What then are we going to take? No this, no this, no that. Don't worry. I don't pray you have it, but if you have it, your doctor will give you appropriate guidance that all these no, no, no might not be everything that you're running away from, but at least not to the sudden content that will aggravate a situation. And of course, you'll be assisted out of the problem. Now, if when I've said no large meals at once, then ask me, what do you want me to eat and how? Okay, take small and frequent meals. Now, if we have tried the lifestyle modification and we've not won the battle, then we'll move to pharmacological intervention. Just as we found in gastroesophageal reflux disease interventions, I mean treatment. Antacids can start using that. Then H2 receptor blockers, eximetidine, that is tagamine, ranitidine, Pamotidine, nizatidine, you can help your doctor will guide you through that. And of course, put some palm impedance like omeprazole, pantoprazole, and lansoprazole could help as pharmacological intervention. Okay, if A and B, lifestyle modification, pharmacological intervention will not suffice will not help you out, and you are still down with your signs and symptoms, then you are a candidate for surgery. It might even be an emergency surgery if you are bleeding profusely. So 
we end up in surgical department when there's failed lifestyle, failed medical interventions, or we are dealing with a severe stricture, massive bleeding, respiratory symptoms, almost leading to respiratory failure. And then your surgeon might have laparoscopy surgery or open thoracic surgery, trachotomy, and will give you fundoplication. What are the likely complications that we might be faced with? Incarceration. This is very common in case of any hernia that is not repaired on time. Incarceration. And with that, that can lead to strangulation. Incarceration, it means it is arrested. It's not going back to the original cavity where it belongs. So it's arrested, it's hot there, and with time, blood supply will be cut off. That is strangulation. That will be very painful, and at that stage, you need emergency surgery. Okay? And of course, there could be gastric vault for us. In conclusion, maybe or maybe not, you're not sure that you can repeat the entire presentation here and judge your own symptoms and quickly contact your physician because it might be asymptomatic and you might think you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, just contact your physician. Symptoms will be there when it is very large and large enough to cause that. Remember, there are two types, the sliding and of course the paraosophagia which will be more troublesome, okay? There are three ways to treat, remember that. You don't want to see your doctor, that might be risky, but try to check through all the modifiable you know, risk factors and lifetime changes, and back on them while keeping your eye on all these signs and symptoms, and then trying to contact your physician. With that, I come to the end of this very presentation. It is not good that you wait till your case becomes an emergency. Remember, the obstructive symptoms here could lead to death, and massive bleeding could lead to apovolemic shock and death you know, within a short period of time. Please share this. Remember to subscribe. Wishing everyone affected well. Take care of yourself. Thank you. I appreciate it.